Good evening. Happy New Year to everyone. Hope everyone had a good New Year and a great holiday. I call the January 5th, 2022 Bremerton City Council meeting to order. The city is conducting a virtual meeting which will remain in effect until further notice and that tonight's agenda was amended to add item three. With a new year, first we have council officer elections. Are there nominations for the office of president? Council member Younger. I nominate Michael Goodnow for council president. Thank you. Are there other nominations for the office of president? Council member Chamberlain. I'd like to nominate Leslie Dogs for council president. Thank you. Are there other nominations for the office of president? One more time. Are there nominations for the office of president? Seeing none, I declare the nominations closed. With that, Lori, do you want to explain the next process or is that Angela? Leslie, you have the uh, script for the- Yes. Uh, yeah. I was okay. 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 So with that in mind, ballots have been distributed to each of the council members in advance with a blank line to print, print their vote. So with that, we'll give it a few seconds for you guys to print uh, nominations for your president, city council president. Okay, are we ready for the call of the vote? If not, do we need a few more minutes? I'm seeing everybody looking like they're ready. With that, if you can, um, we're gonna simultaneously hold up our ballots on the screen. I don't know if Mike can be seen though, huh? Uh, might be a little yeah. difficult. Is that better? No, maybe not. I don't know. I'm going to call out each council member's name so it will come up on the screen. Thank you, we'll do that then. Okay. Uh, council member Chamberlain, you can stay here and hold up yours so it will recognize you. Here. Thank you. Council member Chamberlain for council member Dogs. Council member Dogs. Here. I don't know if you can see it, but it's my name. Thank you, Council Member Dogs. This is Council Member Dogs. Council Member Coughlin. Here. You can say good now, okay. Um, Council Member Coughlin for Council Member Good now. Council Member Dennehy. Here, and I'm sorry, my printer was out of ink, but uh, Michael Good now is my vote. I see Council Member Dennehy has voted for Council Member Goodnow. Council Member Goodnow. Here. Thank you. Council Member Goodnow has voted for Council Member Goodnow. Council Member Simpson. Here. Okay. A little bit of a lag here. You do it one more time. Here. I'm voting for Michael Good now. Thank you. Council Member Simpson is voting for Council Member Good now. And now we have Council Member Younger, which I see yeah. Council Member Young is voting for Council Member Good now. Right. We have five votes for Council Member Good now and two votes for Council Member Dow. Thank you. I now pass this meeting to President Michael Goodnow. 
Wow, that was uh, that was surprising to hear. I think. Uh, anyways, um, so uh, up next, are there any nominations for the office of vice president? I see uh, Council Member Chamberlain's hands up. Oh, uh, Council Member Younger's hand is up. I nominate Jeff Coughlin for Council Vice President. Thank you. And uh, Council Member Dennehy. I nominate uh, Council Member Dobbs for Vice President. Thank you. Are there any uh, nominations for the Office of Vice President? All right, last time. Are there any nominations for the Office of Vice President? All right, just like in the last cycle, um, you will uh, put your vote uh, down and um, we will at, at the same time simultaneously raise them up. All right, is everybody ready? All right. Make my screen bigger here. Okay. Council member chamber. Here. Can you see it? Let's see those. Thank you. Uh, Council member Dowd. Here. And it's hard to see, but it, I wrote Leslie. Council member Dowd for council member Dowd. Council member Coughlin. Here. Council member Coughlin for council member Coughlin. Council member Denny Key. Sorry, uh, Dowds as well. Okay. Council member Denny Key for council member Dowd. Council member Big now. Council member good now for council member Dowd. Council member Simpson. Council member Simpson for Here. council member Cox. Thank you. Uh, council member Younger. Council member Younger is for council member Coughlin. So we have uh, four for council member Dowd and three for council member Coughlin. We have council member Dowd as vice president and council member uh, Goodnow as president. Thank you. Thank you everybody for going through that process and, uh, and having uh, confidence in us to uh, help uh, wrangle this group. Um, let's see. Um, we're uh, expecting a briefing by Congressman Kilmer and that is gonna be, uh, he's gonna join us at 545 unless he's here, which I don't see. Uh, mayor Wheeler, can, would you be willing to give the mayor's report? Yes, I would. Thank you, um, Council President Goodnow. Um, so yeah, let's just have a couple of remarks. So we'll just, I've got a slide ready to go. All right, Kelly, next slide. So I just wanted to start off um, wishing you a happy, happy new year. And, um, and of course, all of the folks, the citizens in Bremerton and our, everybody is viewing tonight. I'm looking forward to, and optimistically so, looking forward to an improving 2022 with, with bumps along the way, but improvement. So, um, and congratulations, uh, council, council members, uh, Goodnow and Dougs for stepping up into leadership roles. Very important. I look forward to working with you in, in the coming year. So now on to the main slide. 
So just, just a little bit of statistics uh, from the last snow event over the holidays. Um, you can see for yourself, uh, you know, just, just some numbers here, how much sand, how much brine went down. I, I will say we went into, um, we, the city, um, began pre-operations pre, uh, on Christmas Day, about 11 a.m. Christmas Day, and that was uh, laying down brine. Um, and that kept, kept going until the um, good portion of primary and secondary routes covered, ready to go. Obviously the snow hit and we were, um, the city staff were on it uh, almost immediately, uh, pretty shortly afterwards and kept going on 24 hour shifts. So uh, primary and secondaries were covered multiple times. Uh, the ice and the usually cold temperatures did create um, issues. It complicated the uh, service and um, all in all, I'm, I'm proud of the hard work of our staff. Um, they kept at it. Um, the reports I've received, this is anecdotal, the reports I've received where we, um, com in comparison, we did well as far as managing this, um, keeping our roads clear for first responders, uh, you know, allowing folks to get across for essential services. And we know we have a lot of essential services we must keep or running throughout any type of weather conditions. So uh, yeah, just, you know, council, I hope that you're appreciative of the hard work of the folks uh, from our street department, everybody who cross trained and was called to, you know, it was all hands on deck, was called to drive, um, who staffed up the, uh, the uh, mechanics um, office there when they were keeping this equipment running. And of course, first responders and anybody else out in the field who needed to continue working in, in this environment. So um, yeah, just good job by them. And we'll assess, we'll assess our snow response as always. And, we'll, and I'll provide you a more thorough um, feedback afterwards after we've uh, thoroughly addressed and assessed it. So that's, that's it for me tonight, council. Um, and I'll stand by, thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, were there any uh, questions on the mayor's report? Ah, beautiful timing. All right, seeing none. Um, I have my hand raised. Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it blended Hi, in here. Uh, I am curious how many snow plows we had in our region in Bremerton, and do you know how many are in are assigned to Kitsap County? I. I don't. I that'll be part of the briefing. Is um, and I, but I will add that, um, Councilmember Chamberlain, to you know our feedback is how many are in, in the county compared to how many in the city of Bremerton, and um, yeah, and um, try to get as much information for you as possible. Obviously, we're when we debrief, um, you know, it's important that we you know, show you what we did with the resources that you budget us for and then what we might, what we might need to do better because we're always going to try to do better. Um, so yeah, I'll get you the information. Thank you. All right. Oh, by the way, I, I didn't get a chance to comment on your, your artwork behind you, but that's a uh, very nice artwork back there, council member. Thank you. It's uh, heavy jeans, toasters. Yeah. Some might recognize them. Lillian Walker. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. All right. Uh, next, we have a briefing by uh, Congressman Derek Kilmer. And uh, Derek, do you want Katie in the room in the Zoom as well? She says, okay. So um, you can unmute and uh, take it away. Thank you for being here. You bet. Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's good to see everybody, and and uh, uh, thank you for the invitation to to join your meeting tonight. Um, uh, let me just start with some gratitude to each of you. I, I know this has been a tough couple of years, both from a public health standpoint and from an economic standpoint. And I just want to say thanks uh, for your leadership and for your partnership. Um, uh, the mayor and, and the council and the city staff have been on the front lines. And I just want to say thank you. I just I appreciate all that you've done to 
help uh, the citizens of Bremerton make it through what has been a really challenging couple of years. Um, I know we still have plenty of work to do, uh, but I do think it's worth just remembering some of the progress that we've made so far. If you go back just one year ago, the headlines were very dire, right? As 2020 came to a close, there were articles about food banks facing record demand and about historic housing instability. Far too many of our local employers were still really on their heels. Um, most of our kids were still in virtual school and we had not yet seen the widespread rollout of vaccines. You know, and that's why early in 2021, uh, Congress passed the American Rescue Plan which was really intended to be a, a way to um, turn the corner on this pandemic, to get folks vaccinated, to enable our kids to get back to school safely, to support our local businesses, and per, in particular, some of the hard hit sectors, including our restaurants and our, our theaters and cinemas um, uh, that have just been really challenged through this. And importantly, to provide some immediate and direct relief to just help folks to keep a roof over their heads and to feed their families and to pay their bills. Um, and that included some funding for um, cities and counties and tribal partners, acknowledging that um, you are kind of the leads on the ground in being able to recognize the greatest needs and to get funds where they are most urgently needed. And here's what we know, it helped. Right, it provided a huge boost to our economy. Um, we've seen nearly 6 million jobs that have been created since the passage of that American Rescue Plan. A couple hundred million Americans are vaccinated. Uh, unemployment uh, claims are at the lowest they've been since 1969. Apologies for the barking dog in the back. You may, over the course of my presentation, hear a child um, practicing the trumpet and dogs barking. Sometimes it's hard to tell which is which. Um, but listen, the, the, the American Rescue Plan, I think, has made some important progress, and I think better days are on the horizon. Now, part of my optimism stems from the passage also at the end of this past year of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which was a bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, it's a law that, in a nutshell, is about putting people to work, putting people to work now, um, building these projects and laying the foundation for economic growth over the long haul by investing in roads and bridges and transit and water systems and ports and broadband. You know, it's really about recognizing that we can't compete in a 21st century economy with 19th and 20th century infrastructure. So let me just say a little bit about why this matters to our community. Well, one, we are blessed to have an outstanding port, which is an amazing engine of economic opportunity for our region. And um, this bill provides investments for port related infrastructure so we can address any sort of maintenance backlogs and reduce congestion around our ports and make our ports greener. That is an opportunity for the Port of Bremerton and for other ports in our region. Making investments in our infrastructure matters for everybody who's tired of sitting in traffic. Um, like many of you, um, I'm pretty sure the speed limit signs in some parts of our region are only there for nostalgic purposes, um, particularly as you drive through Gorst. Um, you know, and, and uh, passing this infrastructure bill really um, has the potential to be a big deal as we seek to com um, compete for funds and fix some of the long-term problems that we have in our region. Um, in 2020, we formed a community coalition um, uh, focused on uh, addressing uh, the Gorst uh, challenge. Um, and that includes Mayor Wheeler and leaders from uh, Naval Base Kitsap and community leaders and our chambers and our local businesses. And I'm really excited about the progress that we've made in elevating um, not just the problem, but in elevating potential solutions. Listen, having the Navy as a partner in troubleshooting it is also helping to open up some doors. Uh, they've got some skin in the game too. And I'm really glad we're all on the same team here. The, cor the, the corridor is also important for our tribal partners with the Suquamish tribe. Um, because habitat restoration in this in, in, inlet is important for restoring our salmon population. And so this has the opportunity to check a whole lot of boxes, right? To keep people from having to sit in traffic and to help resiliency, which is a concern for the Navy and address uh, salmon recovery. Um, and the infrastructure bill, I think has the potential to be beneficial here. Now um, I'll be straightforward with you, community project funding, or earmarks as they used to be known, were not included in this 
transportation bill, in this infrastructure bill. Um, having said that, what was provided was formula funding to the state of Washington to fund um, uh, significant projects. The state is expected to receive $4.7 billion in the federal highway program funding, over $600 million for bridge replacement and repairs as part of this bill over the next five years. So that positions us pretty well. You know, Gorst has been a priority um, for my office and it's going to continue to be. There are also some specific pots of funds and I'm happy, I don't want to just talk at you, but um, I'm happy to um, if there's questions about some of those pots of funds and when they're going to be coming available, I'm happy to answer some questions about that. But I think Gorst is in a good position to see the federal government be a partner. Um, there are some other things in this infrastructure bill that matter too. It makes historic investments in transit. I was talking to John Clausen and the team at Kitsap Transit. They are very excited about the historic investments being made in transit because it helps take vehicles off the road um, and can help workers get to jobs. I know that that's a priority as we see people come into our region's largest employer, the shipyard and Kitsap Transit, I think is looking at opportunities to um, uh, improve uh, some of the opportunities there. There's also investments uh, that should matter to everybody um, who has struggled to have high-speed affordable internet. Over the course of this pandemic, we have learned that access to the internet is not just about whether you can watch only murders in the building on Hulu, which you should because it's terrific, um, but it's you know about whether you can participate in a city council meeting, and it's about whether you can have a kid who can learn virtually or a college student who can learn virtually or have a business operate uh, remotely or participate in a telehealth appointment. And unfortunately, for far too many people in our region, they can't because they don't have high-speed internet. And uh, thankfully with the passage of this bill, it really treats internet access like rural electrification was in prior generations and says, we've just got to close that digital divide. And so um, included in the bill is uh, $65 billion for infrastructure investment. It's expected to um, get connected uh, every American, including um, about a quarter of a million Washingtonians uh, who should see help here in the uh, years ahead. So that's a priority. There's also investments in the bill um, focused on clean water, uh, which I know has been a priority for the city, and also for, um, uh, for um, salmon recovery, including fixing culverts. Uh, that is a big issue for our state um, uh, as we address salmon recovery and as we address tribal treaty rights. Um, included in the bill was uh, uh, provisions that I led in the House and that Senator Cantwell led in the Senate for a new billion dollar program focused on removing and replacing failing culverts so that we can restore fish passage and help ensure our salmon populations make the recovery we need them to, to, to do. Um, I, I may pause there on the infrastructure bit. Let me just say one thing looking in the um, uh, moving from the rearview mirror into the windshield uh, about what, what's ahead um, here in the next few months. Uh, the infrastructure bill isn't the only big bill that Congress is making progress in uh, on. Uh, I know that there are a lot of Americans who are hurting and are struggling to pay their bills right now. And that's why we have a plan for that. The Build Back Better Act is really focused on addressing rising costs and lowering taxes for families. Um, there's been a lot of attention paid in the press to the kind of the day-to-day -day and sometimes even the minute-to-minute -minute negotiations on the Build Back Better Act. It's a bill that's passed the House, um, but I think it's worth just acknowledging what this bill is about. It's about reducing costs. And let me give some examples. I have heard from so many parents and particularly working moms who really felt sidelined in our economy because they couldn't secure affordable, accessible childcare. And the Build Back Better Act will help with that. Um, that's also meaningful for our local employers who are struggling to find workers. Uh, because it's going to empower working parents to go to work. The bill um, will save most American families more than half of their spending on child care. Uh, it'll deliver two years of free preschool for every three and four-year-old in America, and it gives more than 35 million Americans a tax cut by expanding the child tax credit. I have heard from so many people struggling to pay for health care and for prescription drugs and for elder care, and the Build Back Better Act includes provisions to reduce those costs. 
Um, the Build Back Better Act is about helping everyone um, here on this Zoom who cares about education and the incredible work of our community colleges. Um, we know that our community colleges open the door to economic opportunity for so many, and it's a bill that helps uh, reduce the cost of going to college. It um, increases Pell Grants and it expands some of the Department of Labor workforce development programs so that we can help people get the skills they need um, so our economy um, can thrive. It's also um, uh, uh, a bill that's about jobs, including more green jobs. There's provisions in the bill focused on combating the climate crisis, um, which is not just important for the environment, but it's important for jobs in the clean energy sector and modernizing our grid and building renewables and in protecting our environment. Um, the Build Back Better Act also includes uh, a bill that I authored called the Recompete Act. It's in a pilot form, but it's about helping communities that have too often been left behind, um, that have faced persistent economic distress. Uh, and what we've proposed is some long-term 10-year flexible grant funding to support communities that have faced persistent economic challenges. And Kitsap County, based on the criteria we laid out, um, and the cities within Kitsap County would be eligible for this. It's a pilot, um, but our hope is if we can get this bill across the finish line, we could see some real benefit for our region. And finally, and importantly, given the prior conversations I've had uh, with this council, the Build Back Better Act also includes provisions focused on addressing the affordable housing crisis. Uh, that's really important. We have seen far too many people struggle even before any of us had heard of COVID-19. Um, but we've uh, um, we've seen far too many uh, low-income people struggle. Some of the um, our seniors and people with disabilities and families with kids really struggle to access affordable housing. And the Build Back Better Act includes historic investments in affordable, accessible housing, um, providing more rental assistance and addressing the public housing uh, repair backlog and investing in the National Housing Trust Fund so that we can build and preserve more affordable homes. So all of this is to say that this is a big bill that's about helping our economy do what it says, build back better. Um, you may have seen the chief economy uh, economist at Moody's Analytics, uh, Mark Zandi, just issued an analysis of the proposal and found that it would spur economic growth and that it was ease inflation. And I should mention, it does all of this um, without increasing taxes on anybody making under $400,000 a year. Um, so that's a big deal. And I think by and large, this is something that would really benefit our region. So um, we're working on that. There's some other things on the horizon that I'll just mention briefly, and then I'll stop talking. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, in the weeks ahead, um, Congress has to pass a spending bill. The House had passed uh, nine of 12 appropriations bills. Unfortunately, uh, like a lot of other things, um, the spending bills have gotten hung up in the Senate. But I mention this because there's some huge wins uh, for our neck of the woods in the spending bills as they pass the House. Some additional funding for Puget Sound restoration, some more funding for building affordable housing, and funding for some local priorities, including um, the city of Bremerton's uh, Quincy Square project, uh, which I know is a priority as we look to, to um, revitalize downtown Bremerton I and make investments in affordable housing. Um, some investments for um, West Sound STEM uh, are included in the infrastructure, uh, in the um, spending bill as well. So that's a big deal. I'd also be remiss if I didn't um, quickly mention uh, a big priority that we're going to, that, that's not a only a this year thing. And that is uh, the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. Um, the Navy has proposed something called the Shipyard Infrastructure Optimization Program. It's a $21 billion investment in the four public shipyards. And if you're good at dividing by four, um, that means we should expect more than $5 billion coming into uh, our community. Um, it's important as uh, the Navy looks at recapitalizing some really old shipyards. Um, our shipyard is over 130 years old and has some facilities that are not seismically stable. Um, we do not uh, come the middle of next decade, we will not have a dry dock that is capable of handling the next class of carriers and um, uh, neither will the West Coast. Uh, and so um, these are gonna be really important investments 
both in supporting the mission of the shipyard, but also uh, investments in uh, uh, several generations worth of jobs uh, in Bremerton. So I mentioned that there is some funding in the spending bill for, uh, for the shipyard infrastructure optimization program. But that's something that I imagine we'll be talking about with the city of Bremerton for some years to come. So there's a lot going on. Uh, uh, I, uh, why don't I stop there? And if there's uh, questions or concerns that you have, I'm, I'm eager to answer them. But again, want to just start where I ended, which is with gratitude for your leadership and your partnership. Uh, thank you, Derek. Any uh, questions for uh, Congressman Kilmer? Um, I don't know how they popped up, so I'm going to start with uh, Jeff Coughlin. Cool. Thank you so much, Rep. Kilmer, for that uh, briefing. Just a quick yeah. question for the funding that's coming through for uh, transportation. Does that include the Washington State Ferry System? There is funding um, for ferries uh, as well. Um, and in fact, there was also some in the American Rescue Plan uh, as well. Um, Maybe if there's interest, do you want me to, um, I'm not sure who to target this question to, maybe Councilman Goodnow, the, um, do you want me to run through just some of the programmatic funding in the sure. infrastructure bill? Would that be helpful to people? Yeah. I see mostly nodding heads among your council, so I will continue. So I, I the, you know, the ink is barely dry on this. So I'm gonna basically tell you what we know and some of this may be sort of moving targets, but, the lead agency on the on the infrastructure law is going to be the Department of Transportation, and we literally had a call with them this week about Gorst and wanting to make sure that we're elevating that priority. The USDOT will oversee several pots of money where if we have projects, not just in Bremerton, but all around our region, those projects can compete. And usually the local government um, can be the lead in uh, applying um, for these. Probably the biggest ones in the short term will be raise grants, um, uh, which um, is the kind of latest iteration of what used to be build grants. It's the rebuilding American infrastructure with sustainability and equity grants. Those are maximum awards of $25 million, um, but they go to um, uh, uh, as the name suggests, infrastructure projects that are about promoting sustainability, economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, uh, and equity. Um, the other big, and so their expectation when we spoke to them this week was that that funding may flow soon, like within the next quarter or so. Um, they'll start doing a notice of, of, uh, of grant opportunities. Uh, the infra, grants, uh, what's the Infrastructure for Rebuilding America or Infrastructure uh, Grants. These are grants um, that are uh, primarily highway and rail projects and predominantly projects of national economic significance. They tend to be larger grants and again, in the kind of $50 million uh, arena. There are a number of grant programs focused on rail uh, uh, the Railroad Crossing Elimination Grant Program, the Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvement Grant Program. Um, uh, again, these are going to be brought forward through the Department of Transportation. And as we get notifications of grants being made available, we will push that information out to the city. There are some others. The Bridge Investment Program um, uh, is one. The uh, something called the PROTECT program, which is around resilience, um, investments in resilient infrastructure. We know that, you know, for example, I was just out on the coast on Highway 112, where for the second time in a few years, they've had a um, landslides uh, because of storm damage um, and it shut down the highway. Um, so those are the types of kind of, when I talk about resilience, that's what we're talking about there. The straight, Safe Streets program, which is around, uh, both bicycle and pedestrian um, uh, improvements. Again, so these grants will be pushed out by the Department of Transportation. On top of those pots of money, the federal DOT will provide formula funding um, to the state of Washington. And I, I mentioned, you know, we're looking around the $5 billion uh, arena for federal highway funds to the state of Washington for um, 
uh, it's 4.7 for uh, highways and another 600 million for bridges. Um, and then uh, some formula funds to the state um, and to our transit agencies focused on trans transit improvement. So when I mentioned those um, uh, state dollars, that's where the work around the, the community coalition advocating for Gorst really matters too, because it's posi po positioned us well, both with the state and if, if uh, the city of Bremerton or the port of Bremerton apply for any of these funds, we have a strong demonstration of support from the local community. Um, I should also mention just a few other things. There are a lot of projects that could be eligible for multiple funding streams. And so, you know, the DOT, when we met with them, encouraged, as we talked to municipal governments, encouraged them to apply for multiple pots of funding as long as you meet the eligibility criteria. Um, I'll follow up. There's some information that the DOT has already made available regarding some of these pots of money. There's a website that you can visit. I don't know if I can stick it in the chat if there even is a, there is a chat. Can I, am I allowed to stick something in your chat? Okay, hold on. Let me, this is some of the, some of what's been put out and we'll follow up with more as it's made available. So far, um, there's been the notice of funding opportunities for, for very little um, uh, for tribal projects and for federal state partnership for state of good repair grants for inner city passenger rail. That's the only um, uh, applications that have been put forward so far um, with applications that close out in March. We are told that more is gonna be pushed out um, uh, uh, notice of, of funding opportunities will be um, pushed out very soon. And so again, our office will kind of keep the city posted. Um, you should also be aware that the Biden administration's stated priorities for the DOT pots of money are specifically for things that create and sustain good paying jobs, that improve safety, that combat inequity, and that improve uh, quality of life that spur economic competitiveness, that combat climate change, and uh, that promote environmental sustainability and drive innovation. So it's worthwhile to kind of think about those criteria and highlight those things as um, the city prepares application material. So again, we're happy to be partners to you and I will um, make this commitment right now as the city applies for any of these funds, I am more than ha happy to offer a letter of support and um, because we want all of these federal dollars to come to our region. Thank you. Uh, Vice President Dowgs. Thank you, President Gorman. I mean, good now, sorry, typo there. Um, I just wanna say, Congressman Kilmer, thank you for all the work you do and, and your voice for representing us in this area. Thank you for all the work you do, appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate your partnership as well. I feel like if you hear singing upstairs, my daughter is in singing lessons. So, sorry. <laughs> All right, uh, Council Member Chamberlain. Thank you, President Goodnow. Uh, Representative Kilmer, do you remember when we had our uh, KRCC training and I asked you about that Recompete Act? So I heard you say it's in the pilot form now. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And, and I don't know, are we competitive for those funds or the pilot program or anything? Yeah, based on the amount of funding in the bill as it passed the House, there is probably enough funding for 10 pilots around the country. Um, as the guy who authored the bill, though I am hopeful that as the Economic Development Administration picks those pilots, it's gonna look at our region favorably because I authored the bill um, and we've been working very closely with them on, on the kind of eligibility criteria, even before, you know, this bill hasn't even passed yet and we've had, um, countless conversations with the Economic Development Administration. Again, the idea here is one, to recognize that communities that have faced some economic challenges, they didn't face those challenges overnight, right? The, 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 they didn't fall into a state of, of challenge in one year and they're not gonna get out in one year. And so having some prolonged assistance is important. 
the other thing is to recognize that different communities have different needs. You know, I was down right before Christmas in Aberdeen. You know, in Aberdeen, 90% of the property is in the floodplain. So if they were able to get some flexible funding, they would probably use it to address that. You know, I was on with the Forks Chamber of Commerce earlier today, and several members of the chamber don't have internet access. If they got some federal flexible federal funds, they would probably use it to try to address that. So different communities have different needs. And so the rationale here behind this legislation is to provide some long-term flexible support so that no matter what zip code you live in, you have economic opportunity and that we don't have to worry about our main export being young people. Thank you. You bet. Hey, Council Member Dennehy. Thank you, Council President Goodnow. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation, Congressman Kilmer, and, and being here tonight. I, we really appreciate it. Um, I, I guess the, the one question that I had for you was, um, it's very exciting that the infrastructure bill um, is possibly coming through and that the Gorse um, traffic issues could be addressed. And it's especially exciting that we're you know, gonna receive a little over $5 billion for the shipyard to um, invest in capital projects there. Uh, I guess the one thing that I have a question about specifically for my district, which includes Navy Yard City, is um, is there any coordination between those two bills or any coordination with who um, is directing that money to kind of address uh, what could be a latent issue with getting so much money poured into the shipyard with the amount of transportation and parking that would accompany that. I'm, I'm assuming a lot of contractors would need to be hired, engineers, things like that, um, where, you know, my district has, has consistently kind of felt like a parking lot to um, the, the Navy Yard. And, and so I, I'm just wondering how I can kind of assist or um, partner in a way of figuring out either a park and ride system or a parking building that doesn't just overwhelm our, our streets with, with extra um, you know, commuters that, that we've been dealing with for, for a very long time. I, one, I really appreciate the concern and, I, I, and it's a legit concern. The, um, to be clear, um, the infrastructure bill is passed, right? That's law, and uh, and it's a and it's the programmatic funding is over the course of five years, and so um, even as even the grant making that happens in twenty twenty seven, you know, we're looking at those funds kind of rolling out over multiple um, multiple years, so it, it it won't all hit at once, and I, I hope we have the problem of Bremerton getting too much of that infrastructure money. The um, the shipyard funds is even a longer time horizon. So the um, the shipyard infrastructure optimization program uh, of the Navy is a 20 year program. Uh, and so I, I think you, again, that hasn't passed yet. You are starting to see some, and that's gonna be kind of chipping away at it over multiple, multiple years, right? So we've gotten some of the planning funding done. You've gotten some, the shipyards working on you know, even looking at, okay, so where will things be and how will this work and what are some of the optimal layouts and things like that. But um, in terms of sort of construction dollars, you know, this is gonna flow over multiple years and, um, and that money hasn't started to flow yet. Uh, I don't wanna speak for the mayor, but I, I know when I sat down with both the shipyard command and, um, uh, with Naval Base Kitsap's leadership and Naval Region Northwest leadership for, 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 for that matter. Um, all of them wanna make sure that these are projects that happen with the community, not to the community. And you know they are eager to, uh, and I, I think already have, again, I don't wanna speak for the mayor, but I know that there's been an emphasis placed on, on outreaching both to local communities um, and to tribal communities to make sure that, you know, as we look at potential in water construction, um, that there's a uh, uh, strong consideration of impact to treaty rights. And, and um, so those discussions are, are something I know that the Navy is uh, taking very seriously. That's, that's great to hear. Thanks so much. You bet. Council Member Simpson, go ahead. Thank you, Council President. Um, Congressman Kimmer, th thank you for coming and, and talking to us. Uh, it's, it's always good to be able to, uh, to speak with our elected representatives. Um, 
And uh, so uh, in, uh, to kind of further on the, the uh, conversation that we're having about the uh, about um, some of the programs that are now available to us, um, would uh, would some of the, the uh, grant funding from uh, for transportation uh, uh, be applicable to some of the existing rail lines that we have coming in and out of Burton? And uh, the, the rail lines that I'm thinking of specifically are, are the spur line that goes into PSNS and the spur line that goes through Bremerton up to uh, up to Bank. Um, we could we have a they flow right next to a park property that is underutilized okay. right now, and um, they could be utilized to help alleviate some of the traffic that goes into the shipyard and, and, and also transits through Bremerton up to uh, up to Bangor. And the Navy does already own the uh, the rail lines, and they also own some of the related infrastructure that can transport uh, transport cars, uh, and by that uh, train cars back and forth. Would that be something that that, that would be eligible under these uh, these things? It might be the um, there is within the infrastructure bill. There's uh, one of the reasonably large pots of money. It's five billion dollars for something called the Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvements Grant Program, or it's the CRISI program. And that's pretty, that's an existing program that just more often than not, as it has gotten applications, they say no to more applications because they just haven't had funding over the years. That changes now, right? Because the, the, the um, program gets more adequately funded. So, you know, um, we haven't, it's worth, and, and I'm more than happy to have my team follow up um, with you and with the um, uh, with the folks at the city. If there is interest in pursuing that, we can look at, at least based on the past, what the um, eligibility criteria have been and uh, how we might go after that money. Again, they haven't put out a notice of funding opportunity for that program yet, although we expect it um, to be coming within the next you know many months. Thank you. You got it. All right. It looks like uh, we're at the time. Uh, <clears throat> if you have any last uh, comments you'd like to make. Yeah, I do want to just say a couple things in closing. Um, one, um, thanks for the questions and thanks again for your partnership. Uh, two, um, I want to mention I got a great team and we work for you. That's kind of how this works. So um, Katie Crabtree is our our lead in Kitsap County. She's our deputy district director. And um, I think many of you probably know her already, um, but please don't hesitate to reach out to her. We also, I, I, I wanna say this, not just for members of the council and, and the mayor, but um, for anyone who may be watching, half of our team in the district does what we call casework, where if someone has an issue with any federal agency, we go to work on your behalf. And um, more often than, that, and not, than not, that's um, generally VA issues, just because we have so many military veterans in our region. Over the last year, it's been a lot of SBA uh, issues with people who've been trying to navigate issues with the SBA assistance programs. Um, but social security, uh, lately we've got a lot of people who are traveling again and didn't realize that their passport is expired. So we can be helpful with um, those sorts of issues. So I just, it, you know, we wanna make sure, um, we're, we, I got a great team that's good at solving problems, not so good at solving problems we don't know about. And so um, to the council and to the mayor, if you have constituents who have issues that get raised with you, please send them our way. Um, and for anybody who's watching that may have an issue or know of somebody who has an issues, please give us a holler. And um, thanks again to the council and to the mayor and to the city staff for all the important work you do and uh, appreciate your partnership. And thanks for having me. Thanks, Congressman. Uh, for folks that are watching, uh, do you have any upcoming uh, town hall or events or things like that where they can directly ask you questions? Yeah, we've been doing, um, uh, I just did a telephone town hall right at the end of last year. We will likely do another one um, within the next few months and we'll um, be doing uh, another um, Facebook Live town hall as well. Um, we haven't scheduled an in-person one uh, uh, yet, just because we're not quite sure what the rules are going to be around large group gatherings, um, uh, since we're shooting at a bit of a moving target uh, with the variants and whatnot. So um, I am hopeful that we'll be able to get back to doing in person um, uh, shortly, but um, there are a few variables in that one. Great. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you to the, the service you provide to our community. You bet.
Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having me. Okay, next up is public recognition, which provides an opportunity for attendees to address the council on any city related item that is not already listed on tonight's agenda. We only ask that you please state your name for use in the meeting minutes and that you limit your comments to under three minutes. With that, I will open public recognition. And I see uh, Anna Mockler has a hand raised. Go ahead. Let me be the first to congratulate you, President Goodnow and Vice President Dowgs. Well done. Um, my first request is that the chat, the link which Representative Kilmer placed in the chat be made available to the public in the chat, please. Um, my second thing is to give you a really piece, really piece, a piece of real good news, which is the Jersey reference number 52516, the four-way stop at 13th and Wyckoff has been retired. The improvement is forthcoming. Glorioski, Sandy. Um, my other question, and I, I knew that I should not be attempting President Goodnow to ask Representative Kilmer any questions, but it seems as though there might well be money in this, um, either in the Build Back Better or in the first infrastructure bill to fund the improvements to the wastewater bill under the general nutrient permit department of ecology seems like there might well be money there um i don't know i, I know how much the um, improvements are anticipated to cost but i don't know how much it's you are expecting to spend to mount this appeal it would be nice if we could simply comply by getting money from the federal government for clean water. Um, and my fourth and final thing, I think I'm squeaking in on three minutes here, is one of the things that seems possible that was difficult about the snow and ice removal um, during Christmas week was that senior management took off that week. Um, so even if all available personnel were working um, 24 hours, you know, every possible hour they could, when you just don't have the human bodies there, and President Goodnow, can you convey that to the mayor that I would like to hear about that in the briefing? Sure. I mean, the mayor's here if you'd like to make a comment. Thanks, Ms. Mockler. Yeah. President um, Gorman did not wish me to speak directly I understand okay yeah I, so senior and mid-level management um stayed in constant contact with me um through the entire snow snow event starting christmas morning all the way up till we secured 24-hour operations and so there was no vacation um i can assure you of assure you of that um so yeah my I don't know what to say, and I. Um, this is a typical vacation for a lot of these folks. Um, hopefully, that answers your question. All right. Uh, I will email you about this if that's okay, Mayor. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. And again, I would please like the link to that Representative Derek Kilmer posted. Thank you. All right, we'll take care of that. Is there anyone else for public recognition? All right, kind of one last call. Anyone in the chat for public recognition? All right, with that, we will close uh, public recognition and move to the consent agenda. Thank you, President Goodnow. Okay. For approval on the consent agenda are the following items. A, claims and check register. Approval of the following checks and electronic fund transfers. One, check numbers 396, 396 through 39660 and electronic fund transfers V34304 through V34395 
in the grand total amount of $2,958,781.24. Two, regular payroll for pay period ending December 15, 2021, in the amount of $958,849.36. B, minutes of meeting December 15, 2021. This concludes the reading of the consent agenda. Okay, uh, does any member of the public wish to comment in any of any one of these items? Uh, Ms. Anna Moffler. Thank you, President Goodna. Um, Ms. Hoover, where can I find these minutes? Uh, when I go to the city website, um, they're not usually available for a few weeks until a few weeks after any given meeting. Am I doing something wrong? Um, after their uh, I was just going to say they should they should be in tonight's packet. Thank you. Okay. Any other member of the public who wish to comment in on one of these items? Uh, seeing no, oh, oh, seeing none. Uh, we we'll go to the council council for a motion, and uh, we'll go for uh, Council Member Dennehy. I'll move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Vice President Dobbs. I second that. Thank you. Um, we have a motion and a second. Call for the question. Councilmember Chamberlain. Do I say yes? <laughs> yes or no? Yes. Doug? Yes. Austin? Yes. Benny? Yes. Simpson? Yes. Younger? Yes. Good now. Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Um, there are no general business items tonight, um, so I will hand right. off to you, President. Yep, there are no general business items tonight, so we'll move on to council member reports. Uh, since this is the first council meeting of the month and of the year, uh, we will start with District 1, uh, and uh, that's council member Chamberlain. And I will just note that I remember the first time the vote went around and I didn't know uh, <laughs> What to, what to say? Um, so, uh, and then just for the for our new council members, uh, we try to keep uh, these uh, end of uh, end of meeting council reports uh, within five minutes. So, all right. With that, uh, council member Chamberlain. Uh, my report is brief. I'm happy to be here. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome. I think I've tried to make contact with everybody, and I'm looking forward to working with you. Um, I'm excited about some feedback I've received from my district that people generally get along with their neighbors. That's a super positive, wonderful piece of news that I've received. And, um, you know, I'm happy to be here. That's basically my report for today, but I'll have a better one for you next time. Great. Vice President Dowks. Thank you. First of all, congratulations, President Goodnow. Um, and I also want to say welcome to our newer council members, Council Member Coglin and Council Member Chamberlain. Welcome. We look forward to working with you and congratulations on those who won their recent elections. Council Member Younger, Council Member Goodnow, uh, and Mayor Wheeler. Other than that, I also wanted to say I hope everyone had a happy new year. Um, continue to be safe and watch out for your neighbors during these cold times. Um, and these, these pandemic, watch out for your neighbor and your friends and your loved ones, check out, check in on them. The other thing I wish to mention is our, the race equity advisory committee is still accepting applications for the committee members. Uh, there's three seats still vacated that um, the race equity advisory committees need to continue to do the interviews. So we're waiting for applications. And other than that, happy new year, congratulations to all and, um, that ends my council report. Present good now. Thank you. 
Uh, next up, Council Member uh, Coughlin. All right, thank you, President Goodnow. And yeah, I'll keep this brief as well. I'm just really honored to be here working with you all. Um, great respect for all of you. Um, congratulations, President Goodnow and Vice President Doggs. I know you'll do a, a great job of leading us through this year. Um, I just wanna say it was great, you know, as part of the campaign to be able to talk to as many people as I did in the community. Um, I've got a couple uh, uh, notebooks full of notes that I'm working on organizing and digitizing. And I think that'll help uh, show the priorities for my district and help guide us down the road as well. Uh, working on setting some office hours and planning community meetings uh, for the district, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, and I know on the city end, I think there's some public meetings being planned um, by Public Works folks for some of the big projects in District 3, including Qu Quincy Square and East 11th and Perry and some others. So I'll uh, look forward to working with city on uh, getting the word out there and seeing the public show up to those meetings. And last item I got is finally this Friday's first Friday. So if you're so inclined, come on down to, I know downtown Manette and outside my district, but still part of our awesome city, uh, Callow, check out some local businesses and art um, and get out and about in the community. And with that, that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member Dennehy. Thank you, uh, Council President Goodnow. Uh, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, big congratulations to President Goodnow and Vice President Daugs. Um, I am extremely thrilled that you guys are gonna be leading us this year. Um, congratulations to Council Member Chamberlain and uh, Council Member Coughlin. Uh, I know I had a chance to sit down with Council Member Coughlin, Council Member Chamberlain. I know we tried to connect, but uh, I've, I'm really excited, especially after this first meeting, to, to grab some coffee with you and, and, and talk about um, our, our work moving forward. So uh, congratulations. I, I'm also extremely thrilled not to be the new guy anymore. So thank you, uh, council members Chamberlain and Coughlin for that. Um, yeah, the, the only thing uh, council specific for my district, I, I'm gonna start up uh, council district four meetings again. Um, the first one's gonna be February 27th, uh, depending upon Omicron and, and other COVID related things. I, I'm guessing that it will be um, virtual, but there'll be more information um, on, on that coming up in, in current meetings. Um, also on the COVID issue, um, I, I know that you know it's cold weather, uh, the variant is creeping into our community as it is across the, the country. I've had acquaintances and loved ones um, pass away from COVID and um, have very serious illnesses uh, based on it. So again, get vaccinated. If you're not vaccinated, if you haven't gotten the booster, please get the booster um, and always, always wear your face mask. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Council Member Simpson. Thank you, Council President. So um, first I'd like to say congratulations to uh, to you and to uh, the Vice President Dowks for, uh, for stepping up and, uh, and taking leadership positions. Um, I'd also like to welcome aboard uh, um, Council Member Coughlin and Council Member Chamberlain. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's gonna be an interesting ride. Uh, yeah, I, I expect to you know, hear good things from, uh, from both of you and I really look forward to it. Um, I'd also like to wish everyone a happy new year. Um, since our last meeting, we've, uh, we've gotten to celebrate Yule and Christmas. Um, something else that we've gotten to do is celebrate the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Soviet Union. Now, this represented one of, the, uh, one of America's greatest adversaries. And um, when I enlisted in the army, uh, we were still in, in a cold war fighting against communism. And uh, with the fall uh, of the Soviet Union, that represented a sea change in, in that fall. And it's important that we celebrate that. It had actually happened on Christmas, Christmas of 1991. So, you know, thank you for, uh, you know, for the Soviet Union collapsing in, in, its, uh, in its entirety. Also, as we look forward to uh, what happens in the new year, uh, we do have a, do have challenges with uh, with COVID. We have challenges with uh, with all the things that have been done, um, and uh, I'd also like to also like to you know, shift back to uh, Bremerton centric uh, you know, things. Um, a big shout out to our public works folks. Okay, uh, the mayor's plan uh, to uh, remove the snow and take in. Uh, and work through our, uh, our challenges with the snow um, worked out pretty well. Um, it really stressed our, our resources and really stressed our folks, but um, Bremerton has a, a lot of resilient people and we have some really great folks that work for us. Also, I'd like to you know, definitely give another shout out to uh, our public works folks, 
um, about the about taking care of that uh, that broken water main that was right outside the district at uh, uh, Naval and Eleventh. Um, yeah, that was something that came forward this morning, and they were they were busily working on it. Uh, yeah, and we had seamless service. So thank you. And with that, I wish you well. All right, Council Member Younger. Well, I'd like to echo the sentiments of everyone else. Wish everyone, including the public, especially the public, a happy new year. Let's hope that this is the final year of COVID. That's my hope. Um, looking forward to working with all of the council members. And um, unfortunately, we're still in the virtual environment. I totally understand why. Looking forward to the day where we can all meet in person because for those of you that have not gone to a study session, the real study session, in person. Uh, virtual meetings are fine, but we're missing out on a lot of interaction, a lot of networking and, and just the ideas coming forth. It, we're just missing a lot. I hope society, I understand, you know, this is Zoom and Teams and all that is a very convenient tool, but I hope we don't go 100% that way. Uh, there's something about meeting in person and uh, I'm looking forward to that day returning. That's all I have. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, thank you everybody for your uh, uh, warm congratulations. Uh, thank, uh, uh, thanks uh, for folks for uh, running for office and being willing to stand up. Thank you, uh, Vice President Doggs, uh, for um, being our vice president this year. Um, I want to echo a little bit about what uh, Eric Younger just said as far as meetings too. I do think that I, I just miss a little, you know, there's a, a little bit of that before and after that's, I think, uh, you know, the little, little bit of a social thing that I kind of miss uh, seeing everybody. But um, I, I will say that I was in the council uh, chambers uh, just recently, and it just happened there. Uh, I think uh, uh, well, it was uh, Mike Riley and one of the IT guys, and now I'm embarrassed that I don't remember who it was. Um, were uh, kind of just tweaking. So actually they were getting ready for uh, the mayor's uh, uh, swearing in. Uh, so it was whatever, it was the day before, I think. But anyways, we've got new <laughs> new monitors, uh, some new chairs. Uh, and uh, the, I think the, the bad news is whoever's on the raised dais doesn't get wheels. So I think that might be uh, Eric on one end. So <laughs> we can't be trusted near the edge. Um, I don't have anything to report on, um, and um, this kind of my report sort of tails into the next, uh, which is uh, a briefing by the 2020, 2022 Council President, item nine. Um, so I just want to welcome everybody to a, another a year on Council and, uh, uh, you know, what is it, about 48 plus Wednesday evenings that we'll get to spend together over the next year. Um, you know, I will uh, kind of back to our meetings, you know, I, don't, I think this is several months out. This is nothing I'm trying to rush, but it'd be nice to maybe try to get the council session, the study sessions uh, hybrid in a couple months and then kind of work out the bugs with that and then maybe move to some sort of hybrid uh, regular session. Uh, unless everything just goes away miraculously, uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can at least be looking for that. I think, I think things are in place to be able to do that. Um, I was really against hybrid meetings in general, but I've actually, I just went to a rotary meeting. They did hybrid, they did such a good job, but even it's like multiple people and multiple laptops and cameras and all kinds of stuff to make it. Anyways, I'm excited uh, to, to have uh, your, your confidence in me this year and um, just, uh, you know, hoping to, to make it a good experience and to do my best. I'm, you know, intimidated as a heck to do this job and, uh, uh, but I'm excited to do it just the same. And uh, uh, I'm gonna rely on some of you for help as we go. Uh, next up also, uh, next thing I need to tell everybody uh, is that we need um, committee assignments. So we're requesting committee assignments be turned in by Friday. Uh, and if you don't turn in your homework, you'll just get assigned to something. So uh, you could do it tonight, in matter of fact, they would not take offense. I think most of you have an idea of um, what committees you'd like to be on. So if you can get those documents uh, turned around or, and I don't think you have to necessarily um, 
use the exact form. You can just uh, send an email probably to uh, just the city council email with, with your preferences. Um, so uh, uh, council member Chamberlain. Thank you, President Goodnow. Uh, I do have a question about um, if there's a committee that's not on here. Um, there's been some discussion. So can you check in with me about how we talk about that? Um, so, yeah, so are you talking about, um, well, there's been some talk, are you talking about a committee that doesn't exist right now, or are you saying something well, missing off the list? You know, yeah, I'm curious um, if we could possibly bring back a committee that was um, eliminated a while ago, uh, Public Safety and Parks. Yeah. I'd be curious to see if we can bring that back. So I, I, I will say that might be a good discussion for a study session next week. So, um, so, so for the newer folks, so we used to have a public safety and parks committee and, um, you know, I'll, I'll sometimes a lot of those things, you know, go through finance also and they go through different places. Um, but, you know, I think there's been a couple of people who've brought up the interest in possibly restarting that as a means, uh, it just where just because of where policing is right now and things like that. Um, I think the parks are hanging on pretty good, but um, so um, we could, you know, if you're interested, just go ahead and jot that down and um, I'll have to figure out how we're, we'll move. But that's something I think we can discuss at, at study session. And then I don't know what it would take to resurrect that. Um, so let's and, and let's make sure we want we want to do that or if there's a better way to do that. So thank you for bringing that up. So um, and then again, if I didn't didn't finish saying so public safety and parks kind of was a, a, another meeting and maybe it doesn't have to be monthly um, or maybe, you know, maybe it does. So we can talk about that, but I guess it's the you know, mostly policing and the parks department. So, you know, actually, I, I, I really think we need to bring that back actually now. I just think that with some of the incident at the parking garage and things like that, it's probably a good time uh, to, to bring that back and just um, focus on that. So we'll just, we'll, we'll, when you submit, go ahead and put public safety in parks. We'll still talk about it um, at that study session and figure out how we go about that. But I, I would say it sounds like a good idea. So thank you. Um, does anybody, especially the new folks, have any questions about any of the committee assignments? You know, I will say that as we add one more committee, you know, we need three members to go on there. So that's, you know, you know more assignments to go around. So. Uh, Council member Younger. Yeah, just a reminder in years past, uh, it was helpful when selecting people for their assignments to uh, have the applicants, have the council members put their order of preference, one, two, three, next to the various committees. That way, hopefully the council member, good now, or president, good now, and vice president of dogs kind of has an understanding of what your number one choice, your number two choice, and try to meet your needs, understanding that probably not everybody's going to be happy, but um, that might be helpful. And then the other thing is that the times that are on that committee assignments, four or four fifteen or whatever, that's negotiable, in my opinion, amongst the, the, the committee members that are on that committee. So if you have a conflict of that particular date or time, that's not necessarily the time that committee will meet this year. That's what I'm up, up to the council uh, committee members to determine the date and the time. That, that's a really great point. So I, I would say almost any of these meetings could be changed. So obviously the people who are serving on them just need to be able to attend. Councilmember Coughlin. Thank you, President Goodnow. Uh, I'm thinking, should we note if we think there's a there's a conflict or circumstance just to help make a decision. I'm thinking, for example, the Lodge Attack Advisory Committee. Um, obviously, I volunteer for a museum which receives those funds. So I don't know if that's something you just might want to be made aware of in similar circumstances. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, so yeah, feel free to add a, any kind of note on there. You know, I think that I would say that we consider finance, public works, probably public safety parks, sort of the three biggies. And then, and then there's some smaller uh, assignments and things like that. Uh, you know, the chair of the finance committee does the, I believe the firefighter retirement stuff, uh, just like the 
the um, council president does the police retirements. And so there are some things that should all be on that sheet. So yeah, council member Chamberlain, do you still have another question? I, I wasn't, I'm sorry. <laughs> I do, I have lots of questions, but um, basically I've got the sheet here. So um, I heard somebody say we should put order of preference. And then, I mean, we're gonna have, some of us are gonna have work conflicts. And so should we also dictate on our sheet that we absolutely can't, you know, because we have a job during the day, for instance. Yeah, I mean, sure, but that's back to what Council Member Younger just said: is that in any of those meeting times can be changed. I think I will say that you know, there's sometimes we try to move them earlier in the day just because you know staffs working Wednesday nights with us, and then if you know if we do a late night finance meeting, now they're finance, you know, so we just we try to do the best we can. Um, but yeah, we can we can we can find a sweet spot, hopefully, for everybody to, to get their assignments in. Vice President Dobbs. Thank you. I just wanted to also share um, our regional committees, which is Kitsap Transit, Kitsap Regional Coordinating Council, uh, Kitsap CENCOM 911. Those uh, committees are led by other jurisdictions, uh, mayors and or city council members. Um, and county commissioners. So I just wanted to share that those ones aren't as easy to adjust calendar timeframes just because of the other people that are represented on those committees. So I just wanted to let that you guys know on that part. Thank you guys for now. You guys ought to kind of understand. So obviously if it's a city committee, we've got a lot of flexibility, but if it's a county, if it's outside of the city, uh, outside of the agent, our agent, you know, another agency then. Um, okay, Lori Smith has a comment for us. Okay, I think I think that. No, Le Leslie's pretty much said it. The only yeah. committees that um, you guys can adjust the time are the council committees. No, those are always the first ones listed on the list. Okay. And it and there's also a sheet that is like called committee process and that explains the whole thing about the time of the meeting once the committee gets together they can set the time or change the time we've had morning meetings we've had late afternoon meetings it's um, depends on the committee members but i think all of that's been said <laughs> all right thank you all right well i think that's all I have. Um, so again, get those in as soon as possible. Feel free to ask questions. Ask one of us on council, ask staff. Uh, Lori and Christine are always super helpful. Um, reminder that the next study session will be held remotely on Wednesday. Oh, council member dogs, you have one more thing? Oh, your hands up, okay. Uh, next study session will be held remotely on Wednesday, January 12th, beginning at 5 p.m. That concludes tonight's council meeting. This meeting is adjourned. Good night, everyone. Good night, all. Happy New Year to all. <laughs>